guys some of the themes and language that we use today are probably not super suitable for kiddos. So maybe pop this one into your AirPods as you listen to this incredible conversation. Hi, everybody. Jen Hatmaker here, your host of the For the Love podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh, man. <laughs> Right now, we are very much in the middle of a series called For the Love of Sex. And we're just in it, man. Like, we've touched on this subject. We've dropped down an, a, an episode on sex embedded in a bigger series before. But this one is all sex all the time. <laughs> and I've loved it. Talked to some really interesting people. Um across the spectrum. I mean, some of them sort of from like a, a biological, almost medical perspective and some from um, like a personal sexual space. And today we are talking to a guest that kind of comes to us, not just personally with their own story, but inside pop culture as a content create as a creator. Um, because pop culture and sex is a thing. Um, I think we all have memories of our first sort of awakenings, right, that we saw on TV or on the big screen um, or however, you know, maybe it was like Madonna, right? My mom is so convinced Madonna was just going to send us all to hell in a handbasket. Um, maybe it was like north of that for you, for your age group. It was the the boy bands, right? Um, that makes me love you. In life. I mean, I can keep going, but um, maybe for some of you, it was a bit of a quieter, like slower realization that maybe your deep feelings for your best friend are not the norm. Uh, maybe you were a 13 year old girl obsessed with Scully from the X-Files, right? And bewildered why no one else was obsessed with her as you were. So I think whether we realize it or not, we at, we absolutely ingest a ton about sexuality and the performance of sex from these like pop culture moments or characters. Uh, we we learn that you know it's okay for boys to tout their sex conquests and show off their desire, but that girls um, maybe need to pretend we don't want sex; we just want husbands right? Or we can learn that desire for the same gender is frowned upon or othered, or in, of course, plenty of cases, just outright forbidden. And I think there's a ton of messaging that we grew up with that we're unlearning now. And well, it's interesting for me, like as a mom of five kids, all in the young adult space, we have the, we are watching them in real time, change the way that we talk and even think about sex and our bodies and sexuality. Like our kids generation is really different. Um, and of course, at this point we have peers too, breaking down uncomfortable, like truths and lies on sex and culture. And so, um, sometimes this is a, a positive. Sometimes pop culture can give us a new window in which to view ourselves that we couldn't have maybe imagined by ourselves, right? Which is why representation absolutely matters all the time. Um, and sometimes on the other hand, pop culture gives us these shackles of expectations and boxes that we are supposed to fit into that we never did and never could and never will. Um, and so I wanted to talk to someone in pop culture, creating content around these themes, and then advocating for people to explore who they want and what they want and how they want it sexually without judgment. Um, someone who knows personally that the work to free themselves is more important than just making other people happy to the detriment of your own flourishing and who can sling jokes around while we talk about that. So on the show today, I have Brandon Kyle Goodman. Brandon was originally launched into the limelight in the summer of 2020 as their vulnerable, informative Instagram videos regarding racism in America went viral, um, solidifying Brandon as a go-to resource for individuals who wanted to figure out how to be a better ally. Um, Brandon is also a very talented actor and writer for Netflix's Big Mouth and 
human resources. Both shows are very edgy. They definitely cover sex and emerging sexuality. I mean, we actually have an expert on this stuff for the show today. Brandon recently released their first book, You Gotta Be You, which explores the intersections of their race, sexuality, and gender as a gay, non-binary, Black creative. Brandon is funny, thoughtful, generous. We started this conversation sort of high level sex and pop culture, but we ended it vulnerable and tender and personal. And I am grateful for all that Brandon was willing to share as he talked about not just the shows and the content that he creates, but what it has been like in his own body, in his own journey and in his own family. I was incredibly grateful for where this conversation both started and definitely where it ended. And I'm delighted to introduce the lovely, absolutely talented, just kind of effervescent, Brandon Kyle Goodman. Um, Brandon, good morning. I'm delighted to meet you and to see your face. Thank you for coming on the For the Love podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here and to start my morning talking about love and sex and all the good things. I've definitely done worse. <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so I've um, I filled my listeners in a little bit about okay. who you are and kind of I sort of high level for them your work but I wonder if you could take just a moment to share kind of in your own words how you show up in the world what mm. you do um yeah. where you are who are your people that oh kind of goodness. sort of give us the 20,000 foot brand in view okay you know what um uh, I I'm inspired to say that I am first and foremost um family. I'm, I'm, mm. I belong to a lot of people's family and I'm a, mm. I consider myself a, a sibling and that's my, um, mm. my greatest role I think is I being, um, is being connected to people who may not be blood, but, um, who, uh, certainly have such a deep, deep place in my heart. Yeah. And a husband and a dog dad, um, uh, into the nitty gritty of it all. Uh, I'm a multi hyphenate. So I'm a, I'm a writer, a TV writer, yeah. An author. I wrote a book called "You Got to Be You." Yeah. Um, I'm an actor, uh, an activist, a uh, social media person, um, with all kind of the same thread. Uh, I think in all my work, which is that representation matters, and stories That's of right. people in marginalized groups, especially Black, queer, Black, and queer, um, mm-hmm. and this idea of you're not alone, you know, is really important to me in everything that I do. Like, how do I mm-hmm. use my art to make people feel less alone, to make them feel seen, and to have those different conversations um by way of comedy and by way of um Mm -hmm. being vulnerable and by way of you know me opening my heart in hopes that it'll allow or give permission for somebody else to open theirs or at the very least begin to um have important conversations about what it is to be human because it's hard it's really really hard um i'm based in la i'm from new york originally my family is caribbean Mm-hmm. Like Trinidad specifically, so I'm first generation American. Um, I was born and raised in Queens, went to boarding high school in Rome, Georgia. Wow. Fancy. <laughs> very fancy. fancy, very fancy, very triggering. Yeah, <laughs> um, <I don't> <laughs> very, very triggering. Um, yes. and then I went back to NYU, and then I've been in LA for seven years, and I yeah. uh, read on a show called Big Mouth. Um, yeah. and that's probably the, the, the big thing that I do. It's quite a story arc, yeah. Um, I want to drill down into something you said. Um, let's let's kind of start here. Yeah. Let's talk about sex positivity, just overall in sure. general. Obviously, you have made a real career and a name for yourself based on your really profound ability to, as you mentioned, make people feel heard mm-hmm. and seen, mm-hmm. which matters, less alone, as you yeah. mentioned, um, in a lot of ways but particularly when it comes to navigating sex and the various expectations that come with it, depending on the body you're born in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So I wonder if we can start sort of up high. Yeah. Can you just share with us why you personally feel like it is so important to help give people the permission and the confidence to be themselves Period. 
but yeah. particularly to be themselves in bed. Um, yeah. and, and even if you want to talk personally, like this is how, this is how you sort of built this internal mm-hmm. structure to like thrive and flourish just as a person, but then also as a sexual person. Yeah. You know, I will say that um, it's my journey and my exploration is is really new. It's probably about two years old. I think I've always um, obviously had a fascination with sex. And I think that's because as a queer person, you're immediately told that what you are interested in is wrong and is a sin. Um, and you know, being gay, like the, again, the thing that separates you from everybody else is who you sleep with. Right. It's and like who you fall in love with, Mm -hmm. um, everything else you're like, am I human? But people get hung up on, you know, who you, what are you doing in bed? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's so much shame. I think that Mm -hmm. queer folks inherently have around their sexuality. I think women also have this. I don't think I know women also have this, like we are, where our bodies are policed, our sexuality is policed. And so you just grow up with so much shame. And if you have religion, which I did, I grew up as a pastor's kid. Um, mm-hmm. My grandmother was a minister. So if you have religion on top of it, it, it really gets mucky and nasty. Um, and I think, you know, as the pandemic was happening and I started this thing called Messy Mondays on my Instagram stories, where I would basically say, tell me something good or tell me something messy and people started just offering up their sex stuff and then I was sharing my stuff and we were having these conversations around this thing that we all do or want to do or or watch or see because you know I was saying to Johnny Sibley on our different show that sex is everywhere (laughs) it's like it's wild how we don't want to talk about it and meanwhile it's everywhere and no one coaches us through it no one talks about our pleasure about it no one talks about the relationship to your gender your your sexual orientation and how you might have to unpack some of those things around it and so you're just kind of left to your own devices and I think a lot of my 20s was a lot of inebriated sex and not Mm -hmm. understanding the reason that I was always drinking or smoking weed and having Mm -hmm. sex is because there was so much shame yeah. Um, and so for me, sex positivity um, and sex, sex education has been so liberating because it's like, oh, no, like this thing that you do is not bad. Mm-hmm. You being horny is not bad. Your right. kinks are not bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a way to go about um, exploring your uh, sexuality mm-hmm. and your sexualness that is healthy and safe and functional. And you can find people um, who are also into it. You know, obviously mm-hmm. consent is a huge thing, but there's you just, there's so much shame. Um, And I really fully believe this is a long one answer, but I fully believe that if you can tap into the vulnerability in the bedroom, you'll find your power everywhere else. Like if you know how to stand in your naked body and Mm -hmm. ask for what you want and advocate Mm -hmm. for your pleasure and, and communicate with your partner or partners, I guarantee it's just going to translate everywhere else because there's no other place that you're more vulnerable than with your naked body telling somebody, Hey, this you want this, like. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and this is what that's I like. So true. Yeah, That's such a good connection. Yeah. Um, it's sex. is not separate from who we are. It's not no. separate from our life. It's not separate from the way that we work and love and relate to other people. And no. that we are siblings and daughters and sons. And it, it, that it is a, it's a huge it's a part human, of who we are. We're here because of it. That's <laughs> like right. all of us exist because Somebody had to have sex, you know? So like, that's why aren't true. we talking about it? Why aren't, that's why how are this we, works. That's how this works. That's how you're <laughs> here. So why are we pretending yeah. like our parents don't do it? You know, it's always, as you said, it's a separate thing. It's put in a box and like, don't talk about it. That's that's impolite to talk about it. And why can't mm-hmm. we all be talking and learning and exploring and saying, oh, how did you ask about that? How did you get him to do that? How did you get her to mm-hmm. do that? How did you navigate this? Like all these The more we don't talk about it, the more shame we have. And so sex positivity is so important. So kind of picking up on something that you just said, you mentioned in your book um, that you had a lot of good sex in your 20s, as you mentioned, but it was kind of on the edge of you being like fully in it, um, fully Mm -hmm. present, Mm -hmm. unashamed. But when you reached your 30s, it went up like a hundred levels. And so, you know, you just sort of talked through loosely, this is what I thought, but this is what I've learned. How did you learn that? Did you have teachers? Did you have mentors? Was it just a matter of growing older and getting more mature? Was it what you were 
consuming, like uh, in your mm. eyes and ears? Um, did you go to therapy? How did yes. you make peace <laughs> with your sex, your body, your sexuality, your sexual experience in the world um, without realizing, with realizing I don't have to be drunk to enjoy this? Yes, yes. You know what? I think it's a, it's a lot of things that happened. I think therapy was a huge part of it. Um, even though we weren't necessarily talking about sex directly, mm-hmm. I think just the idea of engaging with my existence and really yeah. engaging with who I am and how I want to show up in the world versus how I'm currently showing up in the world and how I want to show up in relationships, I think started to crack that open. Mm-hmm. I think also finding community, you know, as much, uh, uh, craziness that social media can really output. There is also community that you can find in there. So finding, you know, different um, sex educators or other people who are talking about it or curious about it, uh, yeah. because it's a thing about like, when you think you're the only one, when you feel like you're alone, you get riddled with shame. But if you mm-hmm. hear somebody else talking or you hear somebody else say, oh my goodness, I have performance anxiety or, totally. oh my goodness, I have no idea if I should wax or sugar or shave my booty totally. hole, like whatever it is. Like, then you're like, oh, okay. Like this is a safe mm-hmm. space. I actually have that thing too. Um, yeah. So I think it was that and finding my community and therapy and reading um, that just kind of started to yeah. crack me open and, Um, It was really, it was, and my husband as well, like us also opening those conversations and really, you know, when we first started out, there was definitely some like binary stuff and some like uh, top bottom like this that mm-hmm. and and I want it this way and it should just be like this and we had a lot of unpacking to do and it was it was it's wonderful to have a partner who um created a safe space and yeah. uh, I also could create that safe space for us to do that um and then I think it was just like the perfect storm everything started to align and I think the I think when you begin unpacking your history you start to see your patterns um and you start to be able to make conscious choices as opposed to being on autopilot sex drunk was autopilot right like I had no consciousness of like oh this is ro- this is rooted in shame but then when you begin to unpack that then you go oh well I want something different or is there something different is there something mm-hmm. more um and yeah so so a lot of things that's so relatable um it's so relatable obviously you've got added layers um being queer Mm-hmm. being a person of color like you're yes. at all you're at every intersection you're yes. you have them all you have yes. all the intersections are on your plate i identify with what you're saying from a couple of them which in some ways is gendered i understand this yeah. is a woman yeah. and i understand it because i came up in like a conservative religious environment yeah so, all sex was Being just a woman in shameful. The religion. We were like minks and just yes. tearing all these boys down and by wearing spaghetti straps. Yes. <laughs> it was just yes. so much guilt and shame heaped on the shoulders of girls. I yes. mean, girls, look, we were just coming of age. Children. You know? Children. Children. And just, I grew up thinking, oh, something is so wrong with my body. Yes. And this, and I'm the problem and I'm, I'm the wrong. problem for yeah. myself and I'm the problem for all these boys for, too. Oh, yes, like I'm everyone's yes. problem. Yes. So just what you're saying is just like, oh golly. And we never examine that. We know ne- yeah. the thing about that, Jen, is that like uh what I have thought or what I have uh, made it my mission in my life is to really examine all those things because we don't realize that the playground, all the stuff that happened in the playground and in childhood, we're still operating from those same places. If you don't question it, if you don't like ask, it's like, oh, all these things that I've understood as shameful, I'm just now operating from that space. And it's like, you're operating from your five-year-old or your seven-year-old or your eight-year-old. And now like for me, I'm 35. Like I have to be willing to question, well, what were the things that I was told at 12 and how much of that is true? I was told that being gay is a sin. Is that true? No, it's not. But how could I not think that that wouldn't impact how I show up in a relationship, how I show up in a bedroom? I always say as a gay person, it's like every um, image of gay people growing up on TV was that they were dying of AIDS, right? Like that's the only time you ever saw a gay person was that they were about to die. And so like, how could a gay child, a queer child grow up and not be afraid of sex? Of course. If if they're never seeing it in tenderness, if they're never seeing it in softness, if they're always seeing it in, in pain and tragedy. Um, So we have to just be willing to get curious and ask those questions. I love that you mentioned that because 
we pick up on our sexual ethos as kids for a mm-hmm. lot of reasons, what our parents taught us, if we have like a, a religious construct that we're inside of, depending on where we live in the United States, um, mm-hmm. what color our skin is, what body we're mm-hmm. in. There's a lot of reasons, but pop culture is one of them. Oh, yes. Um, it is one of them. Like I learned a lot of pretty shitty things about yes. sex through pop culture yeah. um, and sexuality and what it meant, what it looked like, what it was for, what it, the possibility, uh, some pretty, pretty bad stuff. So I, I, yeah. especially you, you're now located in that. Yeah. Um, that's your genre. You yeah. do, you create for pop culture now. I'd love to hear you talk about sort of, and you just touched on it, but your experience coming up through pop culture, like as a human person, as a sexual person, um, and then your decision to sort of move into this as a career. Yeah. Um, and because you're rewriting a pretty big story here. Like this matters. My yes. kids are watching what you're creating and it's just a completely different world than yes. the one you and I grew up in. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think you're so right. Like even just like, I think about every sex scene where people, it's really um, <laughs> awful on the women's side. We're like, it's one minute and she's had the best <laughs> orgasm of her life. And, <laughs> totally. and, like there's totally. been no foreplay. That's not real. <laughs> That's um, so all these things that yeah. are just like, and, and no one's saying like trigger warning, this is false. <laughs> just so you know, like it's just TV. So yeah. we take that and we think, oh, I'm supposed to perform like that. If you've been around here for a while, you have heard me talk about morning self (laughs) and the things that we can do to make the day just a little better. One thing that should definitely not be in your morning self routine is waking up and having to check your credit score. That is what Chime does for you and your any time of the day self, frankly. With their secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card, you can start to build credit with your own money. Chime reports your payments to credit bureaus to help you build credit over time, and their members see an increase of 30 points on average. All of this with no annual fees or large security deposits or credit checks to apply. So start your credit journey with Chime. Signing up takes literally two minutes and does not affect your credit score. Get started at chime.com slash for the love. That's chime.com slash for the love. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank NA pursuant to a license from Visa USA. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact to score may vary, and some users' scores may not improve. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply, except at Money Pass ATMs in a 7-Eleven or any AllPoint or Visa Plus Alliance ATM. All right, listen up. I have a brand new me course on sex that's about to come out, and it is fire. Look, I don't care if you're single, married, mingling, whatever. You do you, but this course is for you. Because who among us does not want to improve our sex life, right? The answer is no one. So for this course, our sexpert, if you will, Dr. Celeste Holbrook is here, and you are going to absolutely fangirl her so hard. She's a sexologist. That's a real thing. And she has so much real life wisdom and practical tips and takeaways and more. So in this particular course, we talk about real steps you can take to improving sex for you. We delve into discovery. Um, Celeste calls it your erotic sandbox. You'll see. I've said too much. Um, We've got some ideas for things you might want to try. We also talk about the sexual narratives we may have been given or not given and how they might still be affecting us, like maybe the lack of sex ed or lots of shame or purity culture. We're going to unravel some of that and get to the core of how it might even be impacting us still today. We also talk about understanding ways to create long-term satisfying sexual experiences and you guys so much more. I really cannot wait to put this one in your hot little hands. The sex course comes out in March, but go ahead and sign up now at mecourse.org for the best pre-sale price at 40% off. That's mecourse.org for the best early bird pricing. 
<laughs> you know, Big Mouth and writing on that show has been um, really helpful in that because our show obviously does tackle a lot about sex yeah. and sexuality. Um, and just being in the room and having different voices represented. Hmm. So you have women in the room going, no, it's not like That's that right. at all. <laughs> you That's know? right. You have your bosses go, great. Well, how is it? Let's talk about it. What What is that experience? What do you wish we could say? And then saying it, you know, and then showing it. And then even if it's like, uh, you know, we have like two um, on the show, uh, the lead character, Nick Birch, his parents, the Birches are very sex positive. And you're always seeing that the, the father is, um, Elliot is always pleasuring Diane. And like, it's yeah. like, yes, that's important. <laughs> like, yeah. we should see the dad like trying to, to take care of his wife as opposed hmm. to it's always... You know, the woman has to That's cook, right. clean, and, yeah. and make him come. Um, so I think that it's been really cool to to be in that process mm-hmm. of different different experiences and exposing yourself to different experiences and asking different people about mm-hmm. what they like, what they don't like, what has their experience been, and then how do you use that to inform truthful stories that you put out into the into the world? I love this. Um, this goes back to something you said earlier when you said representation really matters and it matters at every level. Of course, it matters in front of the screen. It matters yeah. who we are seeing. The actors yes. matter, yes. but it matters who's in the writer's room too. It does. And, and that those producing. perspectives, absolutely. Like what does the crew look like? Yes. Like, what is the, what does it look Your like top to team. bottom? Like absolutely. that's really when we get a fuller, more realistic picture of what it's like in the world. Yes, um, instead absolutely. of this myopic idea. And what's the response been to the show? I'm curious what your watchers, your viewers, your people, like what's it, what's it been like having this in the world? Uh, you know, we're on season six, which is, yeah, we just released season six, which is a long incredible. time for an incredible show, it, or especially a Netflix rare. show, like very rare. rare, you know. Um, and I think it's because I think it's because of the different unique voices that are yeah. behind the camera, if you will. Um, and I think it's because we've been able to give people language to articulate the hardest part of you know growing up, which is puberty. You know, like Hopefully. no one wants to, like puberty is like when your body is going crazy and people are like abstinence. <laughs> You're like what? I like, I don't, I can't like all these feelings, abstinence. What are you talking about? (laughs) Like all like pimples, like, you know, um, beauty, um, like growing uh, growth spurts, like all these things that no one talks about the trauma of. I think our show lets you revisit and gives you language to say, Hey, that crazy experience you had at 14, you're not alone. In fact, here's another one. (laughs) Like, you know, totally. Um, So I think people really, uh, feel healed by that, restored yeah, by that. That's yeah. what I thought you would say. Yeah. Um, one of the myths I think that I picked up on as a kid, um, ingesting whatever was visible in pop culture at the time for women, particularly, was that perhaps there was a place for sex, of course, but it absolutely had to be inside the construct of deep like committed love right like yes. you get it yes. but only if you guys are about to get married yes. or you are married you know like yes. or or uh, you know so there wasn't any sense of um exploration or um sex that had it, its own merit outside of like a really long-term relationship yes. and that has been one of the things that i've had to reimagine as an adult i'm curious what some of yours were like um some of the things that pop culture specifically you because you have yeah. such a, a a specific set of circumstances in the world for how you live yeah. in the world and how you flourish um mm-hmm. what were some of the things that pop culture taught you that you had to unlearn and what are even some of the things maybe that saved you? I mean, you maybe had a show or a character or a storyline where you went, I saw that and that mattered to me. Yeah. You know, one of the big things is, uh, I'm, I'm black. I'm six one. I'm in a male body, you know, like 
the 180 pound male body. And so this idea that I should be the top. So I should oh. be the, the one who penetrates or like, I am the, you know, the fantasy of, yeah. uh, the of kind uh, of aggressor, the masculine yeah, the aggressor. aggressor the ma- uh-huh. Yes. Like that really gets put on me um, mm. and never having the space to just be soft and to, mm. to be courted and to be, you know, to be the one who doesn't make the first move. Like that is not, I I'm, I'm taught that I'm supposed to That's true. pick you up and, 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 and I never thought you... about that. Yes. I never and thought about the... that for a man that yes, you have absolutely. that competing like Always. desire. Um, so that was, a, I think a big thing um, that you're like only worthy if you're able to like be aggressive and hold somebody down, which is also crazy because mm-hmm. the other side of that is a black male body that's aggressive is also th- considered a threat. And dangerous. And yeah. so as a kid growing up to be holding these two truths, which is like, if you're aggressive, you're dangerous, but also people want you to be aggressive sexually. Mm. Like, mm. like, uh, what, which one is it? Um, yeah. so it's a really hard line to walk. I would say that Lafayette on true blood was a really important character to me because mm. Lafayette really, um, and I don't know if he identified as non-binary when the show is on, but I think, if the show were to come out now, that character might identify as non-binary, but Lafayette's ability to hold masculine and feminine. And then when they were, um, he fell in love, they, they gave him a boyfriend on the show. I forget the the character's name, but the actor is uh, Kevin Alejandro. It was the first time that I saw a black queer character who is kind of femme presenting yeah. allowed to fall in love and allowed mm. to be soft and allowed to be loved. And that was huge. That was massive. Um, you know, you see like Will and Grace and things like that, yeah. but it's always like a white guy. Yeah, um, but just right. like a black person mm. get to experience that. I feel like right now with, um, it, I just, it destroyed me from scratch on Netflix. Um, oh my you, gosh, I have it yeah. queued up. Everyone is going Brace yourself. Over. Yes, that's what I hear. Brace yourself. Like mm-hmm. have yourself a a, a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> the, the last episode, yep. literally, yep. the last two episodes, I was like, let me just go get this roll of toilet paper. But <laughs> I had exactly never there. seen. I realized I had never really seen um, a love story so soft with a black lead, like oh. we're ne- like a black woman being wow. able to be that soft and fall in love, and it's really and sweet. it's just this like. It's real. Those things are so important because you're just taught strong, strong mask, right? You know, um, and, and needing the chance to be told and shown mm-hmm. you can be soft and you can be courted and you can, you know, rest and you can be happy without all the struggles of, of um, racism or homophobia yeah. attached to you. That's so good. I wonder kind of to that end, um, you know, obviously you've mentioned that one of the first sort of shackles put on you was this idea that you were too effeminate, um, yeah. young at a young mm-hmm. age, even. Yeah. I wonder if you, if you're comfortable walking us through how you came to terms with your own sexuality like, how did you come to your non-binary identity? Was mm-hmm. that, was that fits and starts was it one forward two back or was it pretty was it pretty linear um was it contentious um Mm. your pastor's kid so that wasn't necessarily a super safe environment to be a non-binary kid (laughs) um uh so i just i'd love to hear you talk about that we've got i've got a lot of listeners in my community that are just all along the the gender spectrum and, um, and a lot of mine are sort of recovering evangelicals. And so they too, you know, identified LGBTQ in some way as a lot of them went through conversion therapy, you know, just every traumatic thing that could possibly happen. As you know, even just, even just the rejection or the disapproval from your parents, so traumatic. It's just a, such a deep one. So I, I just love to hear if you are comfortable with it, how this went for you and how you sort of moved through this. To me coming to terms with being, uh, or like, uh, 
exploring my non-binary identity was very recent. It's only in the last, I think it happened in 2020. And the reason it happened is because after the murder of George Floyd, I started making these videos about anti-racism and how yeah. people could be better allies. And those videos went viral. And it's like, well, you know, I practice what you preach. So it's yeah. like, well, what is what is the ways in which I can be an ally? If I'm asking white people to be allies and, and co-conspirators for Black folks, where do I have privilege? And inside of the queer community, I have privilege in terms of like, I'm a, a ma- male, mm. you know, um, tall, mm-hmm. muscly, right. like right. I have privilege. Good so, looking, yep. You know, so like, what is my, thing. Um, And so I started, you know, um, researching more about bisexuality and asexuality, which I realized I knew nothing about, uh, intersex and Mm -hmm. and trans and non-binary, knew nothing about it. Um, So I started, you know, really just guzzling information and I got to non-binary. And so I was watching, you know, videos of people talk about their experiences and why they identified. And I started weeping because Mm. it just felt like I had never heard my experience so articulated. I was like, oh, there's something else happening. This thing that I've written off as just, I'm an effeminate gay, Mm -hmm. wasn't quite hitting it enough. There was still like, the shoes weren't quite fitting correctly. Mm -hmm. And so when I started listening and researching about non-binary, it was like, oh, that, that is what this is where the disconnect has been since the beginning. Um, my inability to fit inside of boy and girl um, mm-hmm. since I was little. Like I, I say in the book, before my race, before sexual orientation, it was my femininity that was the thing that really um, stressed people out. <laughs> like it really, yeah. it really uh, riled people up. Yeah. Me being this effeminate uh, little boy um, Mm. and not knowing as a kid how to navigate that or what's wrong. And so you're just trying to mask yourself because you're like, oh, I Mm. guess, I guess I'm being too femme. And then when you start, you hit puberty and now, you know, sexual orientation gets in. So you're like lumping that into, oh, I'm just gay and effeminate and that's the problem. So I was like, oh, I'm a gay black man. And then in this last two years, of exploring and being like, oh no, there's a li- there's another thing happening here, which is mm-hmm. that my gender identity, this like I've never quite fit um, in the boy or the mm-hmm. girl. There's always been this like, some people will say in between or outside of, but there's been this other thing, this other mm-hmm. um, thing that I couldn't quite uh, name. And now that I can name it, you know, there's you know, there's more information about it, and you know, yeah. we always talk about this like the language inside of gender identity and uh, and sexuality is always changing and evolving. And so you have to be yeah. patient with yourself as you, as mm. you learn and you, and you grow. Um, but it's been, it's been beautiful to give myself permission to explore it. Um, you know, whether it's wearing a skirt, whether it's trying on makeup, whether it's painting my nails um, and I don't have to do it for other people. I was doing a lot of this just in my house, like, yeah you know, we were in the pandemic. So I, I bought some skirts and I would just wear them in the house. And that was, yeah. and no one had to see it, but it was like me, like, is this what I want? Is, do I like this? Do I not like this? Buying heels, um, not for stage, but just for me. And it's like, yeah. heels are really hard to walk in a lot of they're times. The I don't worst. Want to. They're the worst. <laughs> they're cute, but I don't want to walk in them. And they're okay. so pretty and they're the worst. <laughs> they're the worst. Uh. <laughs> but like giving yourself permission to try things without feeling like mm. it has to define you. It's formative is even. Or- yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can do that privately. That's where it matters do it privately. the most. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, because I always, you know, like uh, safety is a thing, you know, safety is mm-hmm. a thing that we have to contend with. Um, and, you know, I have the privilege of being in LA, but maybe if you're in yeah. middle of America, you don't have that same privilege. And so mm-hmm. I always say, yeah, you might have to present as your perceived gender for your safety, but mm-hmm. I hope you're doing it. I want you to do it consciously. You know, I want you to do it intentionally and not in a way that you think that's better. Mm. You're making a conscious choice. Hey, I'm going to wear this because I listen, this is reality and I want to make it home. My mother would always say, just make it home. Mm. Um, And then when you're at home, you do what you do. And and when you get to a safer space where you can, you know, explore more um, publicly, then do that. But don't Mm. feel shame for not being able to always present your full self publicly because you mm-hmm. are, you do have to contend with your safety and you do have to mm-hmm. contend with um, your emotional well-being as well. You know, like sure. 
every day I don't have it in me to deal with, you know, somebody's looks, you know, <laughs> like totally. there's some days where I'm like, I just want to run my errands. I don't want to have to process people looking at me because I'm wearing a skirt and heels. So today I'm yeah. putting on jeans and yeah. a baggy hoodie and like calling it a day. And that's, but I'm making that intention. But you get to make that choice. It's yours. Exactly. It's my yeah. choice and I'm making it intentionally and consciously. And it's not me thinking, oh, this way of dressing is better than the way I dress. It's just... Yeah. Let me accept, let me understand the realities of, of what's happening and, and and take care of myself inside of that. Did giving yourself permission to explore that in whatever way you wanted to and those um, new expressions, did it unlock something inside of Oof. you? Yes, yeah. it unlocked me. You know, in the book I start with, who would I be if society never got its hands on me? Like, that's the mm-hmm. biggest question that I will probably tattoo on my body, but I hope everyone mm-hmm. asks themselves, who would I be if society never got yeah. its hands on me? Everything that we are and how we're performing, somebody taught us and told us, this is what's acceptable and that's not. This is how you should talk about this, this is how you dress, mm-hmm. but And it's like, if you took all that away and yeah. no one could like influence you, how would you show up? Who would you be? And in exploring that, and I think the non-binary piece for me was like kind of like the the final key, yeah. um, the final stone, if you will, for the Avengers, Avengers fans. Mm-hmm. Um, what it did for me was like, oh, before everyone started stressing me out, like when I was two or three or four, before yeah. people started stressing me out, there was this like bubbly child who loved to just play with kind of all the colors in the crayon box of humanity, if you will. And like finding that kid again um, has been really, really liberating to like, Mm -hmm. that's what we're giving yourself permission has done is like to find that kid again, to find that kid who was free and who wasn't stressed about what the other kids Mm -hmm. thought or what his mom thought or what the neighbors thought was just like, hanging out, using their imagination, playing, having fun, like finding that again at 35 has been um, incredibly healing. And that's what I want to continue doing for the rest of my life is is unlocking and taking back what people took from me, um, which was so much. You know, we don't think about that, but so much much gets taken from us through bullying, through trauma, through, um, and through other people's fears for us that isn't even ours. Everyone, we did a thing. My team and I have been talking about this, really dreaming about this for the longest time and 2023 is the year. We are going on a cruise. The Jen Hatmaker and Friends cruise is setting sail in the sunny Caribbean from November 1st through November 5th. And I want you to come aboard. There's like, there's no better way to be at sea than with our crew. We're going to be the ultimate squad goals. Um, so look, this is how it's going to go. The Jen Hatmaker and Friends Cruise is an exclusive cruise within a cruise. So we will all set sail together on the incredible Royal Caribbean Harmony of the Seas ship. And you better believe we have just tons of fun in store. With all of the hilarious shenanigans, of course, along with some heartfelt moments and super intentional times of connection during all of our really special programming. Plus, you get to explore all the incredible activities on board the Harmony of the Sea ship. I haven't even announced who my special guests are going to be just yet. Whatever it is, you're going to love them. Bring a pal, bring the fam, or come solo because we can even set you up with a roomie. No matter what, you'll find incredible new friendships and form incredible memories during all this fun in the sun. I promise you that. So just remember, you have to register at jinhatmaker.com slash cruise with our special travel partner to get access to the Jen Hatmaker and Friends exclusive experiences. Okay. So head over to jinhatmaker.com slash cruise to check it all out. Let's do this. You guys talked a little bit about how this process for you and, um, has been inside your um, sort of family of origin that Mm -hmm. it's been hard. Yeah. And I wonder if you would be okay talking a little bit about that Um, for the people listening who just say, oh, like this freedom is definitely worth it. And, and, and there, there's a cost. Yeah. Um, There's a cost and sometimes it's worth paying. Yeah. Um, even when the cost is sort of the relationship with the family you grew up in. Um, yeah. Can you talk about that just a little bit? Of course. And I'll start by saying, I think that the decision to be you um, will always 
be worth everything else that you lose. I agree. But I will also say that losing those things yeah. is hard. Yeah. Hard isn't even the right word. Mm -hmm. um, it's painful. Yeah. It's arduous. It sucks. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to sugarcoat that, you know, like it's mm -hmm. like, we, we can't like, let's hold multiple truths. Multiple things get to be true. Like this, the freedom to be you can be liberating and allow you to live your best life. But also there is a pain and a sadness and a longing from losing the people that uh, may not be able to support you on that journey. Mm -hmm. So my mother um, about 10 years ago became a born again Christian. So I've always grown up in a religious household. My grandmother's a minister, but there was still a little bit of an ease and a flexibility. Yes. Uh, homosexuality was like, not a great thing, mm -hmm. but I also wouldn't say that I was growing up around a house where like, we were like talking about like, you know, kill the gays. Like that wasn't okay. the vibe. Um, everything was from a place of love, but it was kind of like, well, the Bible says da da da. da. Yeah. Um, and then I can see this now. My grandmother died 11 years ago. And at the mm -hmm. same time, my mother, um, I think in her uh, inability to grapple with losing the greatest love of her life, mm -hmm. um, looked for Jesus and found comfort and safety in religion as so many people do. Um, and I say this in the book, you know, um, Religion is a lot of things and has caused a lot of things, but I understand why people fall into it because mm -hmm. people die. And it's the one thing that we just can't explain. And it's the one thing that like, we just don't understand what happens after, after death. And I think religion allows people to feel safe, mm -hmm. you know, in the middle of this thing that just mm -hmm. can tear your whole understanding of yourself and your life in an instant. Um, so my mom became born again and really took issue with my sexual orientation, um, and really took issue with me being gay. Uh, and we tried to make it, I, you know, I tried to, you know, still have a relationship with her and maybe not talk about it, but the, I'm also Caribbean and, and the parent child yeah. aspect is you could be 42 and you are still a child. That's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> you are still the kid. You have to be obedient. Uh -huh. da, da, da. Mm. Um, and so I had to make a really hard boundary, which was that yeah. because my mother wasn't willing to leave it alone, I mm -hmm. had to leave her alone. Um, and I say it in the book, I, you know, I don't say that with pride. I don't say that with excitement. It was, I don't hear that. Yeah, it was yeah. one of the most painful decisions, yeah. uh, especially I'm an only child to a single mother, mm -hmm. like, if anyone in that uh, scenario, you understand like that's your that's your everything. You are each other's totally. world. Um, but I w was not willing to see my life as a sin. I was not willing yeah. to be ashamed. I had built. I had worked so hard to love myself yeah, and totally. built a community around me of people who love me. Um, and the idea of going back into the closet, no, you just, uh, just couldn't do that. Yeah. Um, and so that was a hard boundary and it really set me on an 11 year journey um, of redefining what family looks like and what yeah. it means. And I think I started this by saying yeah. the thing I'm most proud of is being people's sibling. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's part of it. It's like, oh yeah, blood, blood is not, you know, blood thick in the water. I, I, I hear you, but respect matters. Yeah. Unconditional love matters. Right. Yes. Um, and so if your blood family is not able to respect you yeah. and give you unconditional love, then we have to look at them as people and yeah. would you accept that behavior from a stranger? You probably wouldn't, question. you know? Yeah. Um, and so we can't just keep making excuses because we were raised by them. Right. We have to go, okay, at a certain point, I have to be able to live my life yeah. and, and live it in peace and in happiness and in joy. Um, and if these people, whoever they are, whether it's community or family or the neighborhood, refuses to celebrate that, then I have to put up a, a boundary. And that boundary, I always say, can look different. So for some people, that boundary is no communication. For some people, that boundary is five minutes on Sunday. Hello, mm -hmm. how you doing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Up the phone. Mm -hmm. You know, for some people, it's like, I'll come home for Thanksgiving. I'll I'll deal with yeah. it. And I won't, you know. Yeah. Every, there's not a template for what There's not a template. Like. You make your own boundary. But with always the intention is, I want to live my best, happiest, fullest yeah. life. I don't want to... I'm too grown to be shrinking myself. That's right. 
um, I can't be 35 thinking that like my sexual orientation or my gender identity is wrong. Right. I've spent too many years doing that. You know, I, I have from age, you know, five yeah. to 20 thinking that and feeling that I, I mm. refuse to um, continue that narrative and that pattern, mm. but it's scary. And sure. I just want to acknowledge that for your listeners, it's scary, but you, you find your community, you find your chosen family and yeah. you lean on them. You know, yeah. I think the other thing that a lot of us do, especially queer folks, women, anyone in marginalized groups is we try to do it on our own. Mm-hmm. We really try to like be resilient. And I yeah. think that resilience is a fine tool to get yourself back up, but until you engage with the scars and the wounds, you will always bleed. Mm -hmm. Resilience will just be an armor that will get heavier and heavier and heavier until you actually engage with the pain Mm -hmm. um, and you actually engage with the sadness. My therapist Mm -hmm. will always say, call it what it is. It's sad. sad. It's sad to not talk to you. You feel sad because it is sad. It is sad. And so mm-hmm. feel that, go through that and know that it won't break you. That's good. Um, and I can tell you 11 years later, um, mm-hmm. the sadness still exists. It doesn't mm-hmm. go away. But you think about the, there's a scale to it, right? There's so much happiness okay. and so much joy. So that sadness, it's there, mm-hmm. you know, the little percentage, but in the grand scheme of my life, it's mm-hmm. not, it doesn't overwhelm my life. My my life is overwhelmed with happiness and, and peace because I made that decision 11 years ago. Um, so thank you for, thank you for sharing that. Like, thank yeah. you for talking about that. I, um, I have so many, um, just gay friends in my life and yeah. some of them are still in the closet and some of mm-hmm. them are still just the deterrent of losing their parents approval their grandparents yeah. approval who is mm-hmm. so strong that yeah. they're afraid to move forward but what you're saying is true you're going to pay one way or another so you're it, 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 the closet makes you pay and yes. and the cost is your mental health yes your genuine joy Yes. Your capacity to like blossom in the world, yes. um, being seen and loved for who you are. You for sacrifice you all are. that. So all that is sacrificed. Yeah. If what you're trying to do is keep the peace. That's not really peace. That's only somebody else's peace. It's not yes. your peace. Yes. And, and it's so your life. It's you have, your life. I would say you have one life. Are you going to live it for you or are you going to live it for somebody else? And the th- I, I had a, a, a teacher who... Uh, was in the closet and I found out after his mother passed finally came out. But at that point he was like in his fifties and it's like this whole life that you've missed, you know, um, for this other person. Uh, And I, you know, like you got to do it in your own time, but don't miss out on your life for somebody else's approval. Um, Gosh. They will come oh. around if they want to. They will come around. They can come around. There are many stories they of people can, coming around. They can come do. around, and a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. Um, so don't lose yourself uh, and lose out on, as you said, you don't know all the people. The quote is like, you ne- you haven't even met all the people who are going to love you yet. Yeah. You know, so like holding on to the approval of a grandparent or a parent when there are so many people That's out right. there who will love you as you are. That's right. Go go in that way. Go in that direction. Even if it is just for the love of your own self, I mean, the data here is very unambiguous that people who are unable to be loved as they are in their bodies and their sexuality, um, it literally breaks their hearts and their minds and their bodies. Literally, it is devastating for your health, for your soul. Uh, It is, it's not neutral. And so even for the love of yourself, Choose Absolutely. your own internal joy. And then it'll be some, it's, a, it is amazing when you let your light kind of shine, how many uh, people like come to bask in it. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. I always say self-love. It sounds so corny, but it is it's the just thing real. that saved my life. It is yeah. real. Like loving yourself and knowing that you're worthy and filling your cup up and like moving in the, like, it's again, it's arduous because everything around you is telling you that you're wrong. I mean, the whole beauty <laughs> industry is telling you that everything about you is wrong. Everything, every pop culture tells you that your body, your skin, your gender is wrong. So it is radical. It is a radical act to yes, love yourself is. in mm-hmm. our world. 
but get about the business of learning how to do it. You know, it's going to mm-hmm. take some work, but get about the business because on the other side of that is a, a life worth living. And I think that so many of us are surviving when we should be thriving. I love it. That's the perfect place to end. Thank you for that. That <laughs> yes. is encouraging and hopeful and, yeah. a lo- and lovely to hear and lovely to see um, uh. just to watch you live in this world, like to the outer edges of your capacity and your potential to be so loved for who you are, to be free, to be um, not just a person and a husband and a sibling, but a creator too. Like you are now able to create probably your best work yeah. because you're so, you were living truthfully and, yes. and beloved for it. And so it's just wonderful to see. I think you're setting a good example and for more than one reason. You're doing it in your work, but you're also doing it just in your life. Um, And so it's fantastic. I have one more question for you. Yes, please. This is actually a question that I ask um, all of my guests every series. And I I would love for you to answer this however you want. Like some people answer this really earnestly and some people answer this in an absurd way. And they can, (laughs) it all fits. It all fits. fits. I love it. I borrowed this question from somebody else. Um, But she said, what is saving your life right now? Oof, what is Mm. saving my life right now? Mm -hmm. Mm. My, I have some, there are like two or three friends who I like talk to pretty much every day. Mm. Um, Even if it's like, hey, how are you? I love you. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is saving my life. I think it's grounding and like people who are like, Hey, did you eat? Are you rested? Yes. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. did you, did you take a nap? How you doing? You know, like yeah. that having those like couple people who are, who are checking in on each other. Cause we know that we're workaholics and we'll mm-hmm. <laughs> work to the bone and need to like sit down, um, is saving my life. Also, I'm going to add, uh, just cause I'm a workaholic and this book is helping me. Um, uh, rest is resistance. Uh, hmm. uh, Hersey, I think is the name, um, is also saving my life. It's this book. Um, if she on Instagram, she's the nap ministry, but it's basically all oh. about, Oh, oh yes. I know about this. Yes. yes. It's get the book or I'm uh-huh. listening to the audio book, rest is resistance. And this idea of like, how do we get rid of grind culture, especially just oh, in gosh. life like that? It's okay gosh. to sit down. It's okay mm. to nap. It's I'm okay. I'm not going to either. I love a deadline. I thrive on a deadline. I don't know who I am without a deadline. You know, your, your, your worth comes from your productivity. Um, and so I'm really working on, on, on breaking that. So that Mm. is. uh, I love both of those answers. Yes. Um, I, I, I need both of those. How about you? What's saving your life right Mm. now? That's a great question. I, um, nobody ever asked me that. That's so funny. (laughs) I, I think I've just come through a super busy season of I have yeah. book release and you know how that is. It's just, a, yeah. it's just it's nose so to the mad. grindstone, um, <laughs> yes. absolutely, just packed, absolutely yeah. packed. And I've just crested the mountain and I'm just starting sort of the downhill. Yeah. Um, and so I, this is more information than you've asked for. But I, want I was it. <laughs> married. I was married for 26 years and and got divorced at the beginning of the pandemic in a very like shocking way. Just did oh not God. expect it. We have five kids. Like oh my God. didn't see that coming. Didn't want it. Wasn't a part of it. Yeah. We didn't want it anyways. Um. I thought well, hell, I'm. I mean, at the time I was 46. I'm like, what is there? I don't even know what 46 year olds do out in the world. I have no idea. I've been married for so long. Yeah. Um. And worked really hard at the rebuild and the recovery. We have it yeah. inside of us. We we have everything we need inside of us to do it. Yeah. And yeah. I'd had a, I'd made a lot of good deposits for a long time. So I was able to draw on that. And then right about the time, I'm like, I have made it. Like I am stronger than I even was. And I've learned what I can, what I'm capable of. And I've mm-hmm. faced a lot of my own shit too. And what this is mine to deal with. Like I'll, yeah. I'll either deal with this or I'll take it into the next thing. Right about that time, a man just wandered into my life and <gasps> uh, he's, um, you were talking earlier about some of your viral work, viral work around anti-racism. He has that too. Yeah. Um, his name's Tyler Merritt and he's done an incredible, 
he did a huge viral video called before you call the cops and oh. he's he's a big six two black guy so he he's he, got all uh, he's, he got, he's he think a certain thing about him too yeah, um, yeah. he's just delightful oh and it's i love just, that everything feels ex- this is like a bonus like bonus love. I didn't see it coming. I didn't expect it. I didn't think I even deserved it. And so Ugh. it just is, we just spent the weekend in New York. And just, <laughs> I'm so happy. I just I couldn't believe chills. it. Who I knew love you that. could fall in love again at this age? You can. Ugh, you Exciting. can. Yeah. I Thanks love, for asking. I love that answer. I have chills. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so what sweet. a way to like open your heart. Like your heart yeah. has expanded even yeah. more, right? Exactly. Ugh. exactly. Ugh. And I love that. So that's here we are. Here we You're are. young married and I'm in love. <laughs> I Lucky love us. it. I love Lucky it. Us. Yes. I love it. Um, last thing. Can you just tell my listeners, please, Brandon, where to find you and your work, your book, all the things like people yes. are going to want to definitely have you in there. Absolutely. In their feed. I'm, I'm mainly on Instagram, my full name at Brandon Kyle Goodman, um, but then you'll find me not on Twitter these days, <laughs> but you'll find me mess, <laughs> mess. mess. <laughs> not on Twitter these days you find me on tiktok uh and my book is yeah. called you gotta be you how to embrace this messy life and step into who you really are um just remember you gotta be you you'll be fine but you can get that at your local bookstore or uh online um and big mouth season six is uh now streaming on netflix good um, job so you, you. yes you're killing it you're thank just out you. there killing it it's exciting out here, out here yes thank you exciting thank you for working hard and being creative and being courageous and being uh, truthful it's just all we need right now. that's everything we need right now everything so, we need <laughs> that's it thank you've you for got doing the, the formula thank um you. okay i'm just delighted to have met you thanks all for right, being on the show care. yes thank you all right you guys i mean i told you we were gonna have a series around sex and we are having a series around sex okay um this is not a place for us to clutch our pearls but rather to really discuss on its face huge ideas around bodies and desire and pleasure and sexuality and exploration i wanted this for us i wanted us to be able to have this conversation sort of gloves off and create a room where all of us can come in and pull up a seat to the table and talk about these themes without shame or without embarrassment. Um, And I think that matters. It's mattered for me a lot to unravel the shame that I have literally had a lifelong experience with around sex. And so um, thanks for hanging in guys. Um, I love it. I love that you're here. I love these guests. I love that we're having new conversations on the podcast that we haven't really had before in their entirety. And so more to come, (laughs) you're you're just not going to want to miss any of it. Um, I'll have all the stuff about Brandon over at jenhatmaker.com underneath the podcast tab. So I'll have show notes, links to Brandon's, um, socials, and of course their book, and we have a lot to learn from Brandon's story, even as even if you're just a straight white girl, so literally the opposite, um, still being who you are and prioritizing your good heart and the way that you were meant to live in the world and flourish in the world, that's all of us. Brandon had so much to teach us, and I was just delighted to have them on the show. So. You guys, thanks for listening to this sizzling series here right out of the gate of 2023. And I will see you next week.